Praise the Lord. Well, here we are again at the First Assembly of God of Atalanto in beautiful downtown Atalanto, California, USA. Um, I'm Brother Louis Medina, and I'm here with my tech support, Angela and Charity. And uh, we're in the book of First John. Uh, last Tuesday, I got into it a little bit. I, I reviewed this last Tuesday's uh, session. I was not, I apologize, I wasn't happy with it. So we're going to do a little review on chapter one again. And um, I hope you bear with me. I'm one of those teachers that, that uh, believes in this, these three words. I always repeat this in the class. You get tired of it. It's context, context, context. And to not, not to take something out of it and not to bring something into it that doesn't belong there. But the context of 1 John is so important, so foundational, that it merits a review and we need to get over it again. Uh, let's put this back in context as far as time. This is, this is uh, John the Apostle. This is, uh, most scholars believe this is uh, 85, 90 AD. Uh, most scholars believe that John is actually the last surviving of the original disciples. John is, um, he's referred to in the scriptures as John the Beloved. And there's a portion of scriptures that says that John is the apostle loved by Jesus or and, and I it kind of kind of bugged me about that. I says, um, gee whiz, Lord, uh, did you love John more than you love Peter or Paul or me? <laughs> but it's, it just says that John, the beloved and the apostle that Jesus loved. I'm one of those who believe that he put that in there. Uh, does God play favorites? Um, no, he doesn't. But. Again, it depends on the relationship. It depends on one-on-one, -on -one. amen? All right, give me a good example. I have, uh, counting right now, I've got 11, 12 grandchildren. They, they differ in personalities. They differ in, in how, you know, we got all these kids in our family, and they're so different from each other. Some are this way and some are that way. And I was asked one time a dangerous question in front of my granddaughters, who's your favorite grandpa? You know, who's your favorite grandchild? Any grandparent to tell you, no, you don't touch that with a 10 foot pole. You don't touch that question. No, no, no. I actually do not have favorites. Actually, I understand how God loves equally. This, this grandchild might have this kind of situation and, and, and merits a lot more prayer than this grandchild, but equally. But one thing I noticed, what grandchild responds to me and has a relationship with me, I'm going to naturally have a relationship with that child. I mean, in other words, if you spend time with one each other, this grandchild more than this other grandchild, you're obviously going to know them in a different level. Amen. Same principle applies with our Heavenly Father. You can have a relationship with him depending on how much you want to have with him. So I look at this uh, um, when we came off Revelation last Tuesday and Revelation 2, 4, when Jesus Christ addresses the church and says, thou hast left thy first love. You can, we reviewed about how you could have all these things going in a church. You can have all these, these ministries and, and you've got doctrine, you know what you're doing, you know your Bible, you've got this going, you got this going. And yet the Lord says, I have, nevertheless, I have this one thing against you. Wow. It merits our attention, doesn't it? What, Lord? What? And it's kind of like a, that can't be right. We, that can't be right. What do you mean? You have left thy first love. You didn't lose it. You left it. Wow. Okay. So that's what triggered me into First John. Gosh. We live in trying times. We live in biblical, exciting times. What do you mean, Brother Louis? Well, if you're any kind of uh, student of the Bible, if you're any kind of uh, listener to the, what the Holy Spirit is saying these, at these times, you've got some things going on that you've never, we've never seen before globally, not just local United States, but all over the world. This coronavirus has triggered a situation where actually you can see how the one government the one application of the world has to come into place to deal with these problems. 
So, wow, it's kind of exciting. And you keep your eyes on Israel and, and the timetable. So it, um, there's some serious things coming down, some serious things coming down. And we, as the children of God, we have to be in tune to God. We have to be in tune in fellowship with him. We're not to go and hide. We're not to have long faces. We're not to go, oh, you know. No, 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 no. No, no, no. No. Now, if you are one of those Christians that are sitting there and you you draw the curtains and you're hiding behind the curtain saying, hurry up, Lord, come. It says, you're one, but you're probably one of those that, um, I'll say this mostly as the best I can, but you're one of those who, who have a superficial relationship with him. It's one thing to say you, you know, I know, um, I know about Jesus. I know about Jesus, but it's an entirely different thing to say, I know Jesus. I know the King of King and the Lords of Lords. I know Son of Man, Son of God. I know why He came. I know why He's in me. I have purpose. If you've got your feet planted on this planet, if you've got too much of this invested in this world, it's no wonder you're having a difficult time right now. The Bible teaches us that we're supposed to invest on up above. We used to say this in 1970 when I got saved. Back in the days of, you remember the great the book, The Great Lake, Planet Earth? Do you remember ministries like Doug Clark, Amazing Prophecies? Back then we were saying we are in the last days. Well, here it is now. We are in the last minutes. We're in the last hours. We used to say this, you have to get ready. Listen. I don't think that's biblical to say to get ready. If you're saved and you're a child of God, it's not a question of being ready because it implies that you were fooling around all the time anyway and all of a sudden you've got to put it together on the last days. Listen, you've dropped the ball a long time ago. So listen to the scriptures as we break it down. Listen to the lesson. Because you can know, the Bible says you can know. You don't have to walk around like, you know, am I in tune? Am I right with God? Am I having fellowship with him? Now, we're going to talk about two subject matters today. We're going to talk about fellowship, and there's another one, salvation. We're going to, keep, we're going to define the two. You can be saved, washed in the blood. You accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're having fellowship with him. We'll get into that. Okay, so the Apostle John, uh, uh, John he's, he's writing these scriptures down. He's the last of the surviving original disciples. And if you, if you look at some of the words in the scriptures here, it's, it's beautiful because remember John and his brother at one time with walking with Jesus called, they, were, um, they got a little upset at this village because they didn't accept Christ. And they looked at the Lord and said, Lord, bring down fire and drop some napalm on this village. So they were called Sons of Thunder, I think. They were called Sons of Thunder. So we got this hot-headed, maybe he was Hispanic. No, he's mixing or something anyway. <laughs> hot-headed John. To the, when we read the scripture, we see how he has matured and he has grown. It's beautiful, really. Why I say that? Because listen, 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 listen. It's still daylight. You're still, there's still grace. If you're breathing, there's still time. If you miss church, but you don't miss him, this is all about, you got to listen to this. If you don't miss church, but you're in tune with him, you, this is going to bless you too, because it's going to, it's going to confirm. When the coronavirus hit and they took away everything that we are normally used to, I've said it in the previous lessons, you're going to find out what your theology is all about. If you're in love with church and you're not in love with him, you're miserable. If you're in love with teaching or preaching, but you're not in love with him, you're miserable. Why? Because you haven't got that platform anymore. 
You're finding out where you stand with him. I'm convinced that this is all for the body of Christ to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. It's a wake up call. Okay. I'm going to go back to chapter one and I'm going to read something here. And we got at you on the word of God so we can understand this. So we can understand what he's trying to say here. The Bible says you can know. You can know. First John chapter one. John starts off with this. That which was from the beginning. We'll stop right there. That which was from the beginning, before there was the creation of the earth, before there's a creation of Genesis, before there was even Genesis, God existed. Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have seen, have handled concerning the word of life. What I say in the beginning is that before we even existed, before the world was even created, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were there. I want you to understand that the Trinity was active. It was there. They were in unison. They were one. The scriptures make it clear to us, listen, it's not a solo trip here. It's not only one. There are multiple things going on here. Jesus said that he prayed in John 17 that, Father, I prayed that they be one as we are one. In other words, Jesus said, those you have given me, that's you and me. He's praying in John chapter, uh, chapter 17, what I call the Lord's Prayer. He's praying that we can have a relationship with the Father just as he did. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that's pretty heavy. That's pretty cool. Can we have, excuse me, can we have a relationship with God like that? Why ask that? Because everybody sitting on the other side said, yeah, sure you can. Hmm. I don't know, but let's read the scriptures, and that's why I bring up the question. What we've heard, and John says, we heard, we seen with our eyes, and which we looked upon. Uh, King James says it even better because the word looked upon, it means that we studied we checked out Jesus. We studied Jesus. And our hands have handled. We touched Jesus. Why is John bringing this up? Because he's saying Jesus was a man. He was physical. He was here. Keep in mind that this is, this is um, important. This has to be brought out because the church at the time, others uh, said different kinds of doctrines were coming into the church. False prophets were coming in the church. False teachers were coming in the church. And they were saying that Jesus wasn't really a man. Anytime you have an attack on the very principles, the very things that Christianity is built on, they're trying to discredit the Son of God, the virgin birth, the miracles, the resurrection. Any of those building blocks in our Christianity, if they come under attack, like many other denominations do, even today. In other words, what was happening then is happening today. They'll challenge you on that. So John makes it clear, no, 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 no. We had fish tacos with Jesus. He ate fish tacos, amen. <laughs> Tell you he was Hispanic, no. Anyway, we touched him, we studied him, we saw him. Now, he's saying this to the up and coming generation, because remember, he's at the end of his, his ministry. He's at the end of his life before he gets um, exiled to the island of Patmos. Yes, where actually we get the book of Revelation. So it's pretty cool. So he's making it clear. Jesus was real. It says here, we says we um, verse two, the life was manifested. And we have seen and bear witness and declare to you eternal life, which was, which, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that we have seen and heard and declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. In other words, Jesus, there he's declaring that we are witnesses and that you can have fellowship with him too. Uh, I want to go back to verse 1 here. It says, the word of life. In the King James, it's Logos. Logos. Look at the word, study the word. That's your homework assignment. Look at the word Logos. We saw Logos. 
We heard Logos. We studied Logos. We handled Logos. Everything from everything that has meaning, everything that has any kind of philosophy, any meaning of life. What does it mean? What does life mean about? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean? What is God? Everything is in Logos. We saw him. We touched him. We talked to him. We ate fish tacos with him. Logos. Praise God. In other words, the word of life. Life became what? The word became, in the beginning was the word. And the word was what? Huh? And the word became flesh. In Christmas time, we use that term, Emmanuel. God is with us. Amen? God became flesh. Praise God. Logos became flesh. And we beheld him. And we studied him. Praise God. Now, is that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And all these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. We can stop there right now, and he's actually given us the reason why we exist. Mm -hmm. A lot of drama, Brother Louis? No. No. He's saying right here that your joy may be full, that you may have the Father, and you can have a relationship, that your joy may be full. God, that's why it's so important, you guys. It's so important. I always often say this, the joy of the Lord is our what? Our strength. Amen? He can rob us of this, and he can con us out of that. But don't let him take your joy. Don't let him take your joy. And, we're, and how do how do we derive that joy? How do we how do we you know keep that going in us? Well, I had a lot of joy when I got saved. What forty some years ago? Got a lot of joy when the Holy Ghost would come into me and baptize me. He often tickles me, and I start laughing for no reason at all. That's joy. That's that. But the joy of the Lord really actually is because I know I am with the Father and the Father's with me and I have fellowship with him. I am right with my heavenly Father and my Father is okay with me. Oh gosh, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not perfect, but I am perfect in Christ Jesus. Don't, don't think, look at me, that this guy thinks he's arrived, but I have arrived in Christ Jesus. Don't look at me because I know where I'm from. I know where I came from. OK, so that's what I'm talking about. That joy. He says, he says, I write to you that your joy may be full. He's addressing this. OK. Oh, man. Get that. Get that. What he's John is laying down for you. He's laying down a foundation. He's giving you the reasons why he's writing this. He's 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 a preacher. He's a man who has, has the awesome, beautiful responsibility of bringing you into relationship with the Father. Anything that isn't contrary to that principle is of the enemy. Anything that's contrary to that principle is of man. So, remember that. So, today in the morning, this is, you're going to definitely going to have to uh, think about what we're going to say this morning. I, I pray you do anyway. Praise God. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit here because I'm going to break it down a little bit and then I'm going to have Charity read for us. For this message we have heard, this is verse 5, please follow with me. This, this, this is the message we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light. I want to pause there because that, you know what, has the tendency to do this. No, you've got to absorb this. This is a message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We can stay on that all morning. God is light, in him is no darkness at all. Okay, you want to debate that? Okay. No, you can't. It's plain and simple. If we say we have fellowship with him, listen to what John is saying. We walk, it says, if we, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, 
we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ and his son cleanses us from all sin. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, in other words, he's saying here, there is no darkness in God. God is light, pure light. He's illuminating. <laughs> I have an example of one time you go into a room, you turn on the light and what takes off, amen? There's no, there's no darkness in God. In fact, that might be some of the reasons why nobody wants a relationship with God. What are you saying, Brother Louis? Well, think about it. You're going to have a daily relationship and talk and talk with an all-sovereign knowing God who is illuminating all around you and exposing. When you turn on the light, it exposes what? Anything that's, that's not light, it exposes it. I'll say it again. Anything that is not of light, he's going to expose it. Well, I don't want God to expose it. I'm not sure I want a relationship with him. Some people are that way. But if you're born again a child of God, you're going to want a relationship with him. In fact, I can't imagine being born again and say to one of his one of his. I can't imagine God's DNA living in me and not want to seek his face, not want to have a relationship with him. Are you kidding? No. Jesus says, if you thirst and hunger after righteousness, he'd fill you up. In fact, when you turn on the light, aren't you attracted to it? Well, okay, let's read on. He says, he said, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, whoa, he says, hey, if you're claiming to have a, a fellowship with him and you walk in darkness, whoa, we better define darkness. We better sit there and go, what do you mean darkness? Well, very simple, people. What's the opposite of light? Hmm? What's, what is darkness actually is the absence of light, Right? Well, that's pretty heavy. No, it's not that heavy. Pretty obvious. It's pretty plain. Anything that is not of light is darkness. So, John, the scriptures are saying here, if you're claiming to have fellowship with the Father in your darkness, oh, listen to this one, you guys. You're a lie. Well, wait a minute. Brother Louis, time out. Let's read that again. <laughs> if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Wow. Okay. Don't turn off. Don't, don't turn it off. There's, there's, there's going to be an answer to this. <laughs> but you need to absorb this. Why? Don't you want to know? Don't you want to know the antidote? Don't you want to know the answer to this? Come on. We're not talking about sin, uh, sin perfection here. Okay? Everybody knows once you get saved, oh gosh, wouldn't it be beautiful? You got saved and everything was taken care of? Uh -huh. Instant, instant sinless perfection? No, no, no. It doesn't work that way. Um, it doesn't work that way. Amen? We call it sanctification. It's a big word for, hey, uh, you work out, you work out what God worked in. Sanctification, that's a one way of putting it. But believe me, it's a growing process. But we need to understand in the scriptures, you cannot claim to have fellowship with the Father if you are walking in darkness. But Louis, I'm saved. Okay. I didn't say you weren't saved. Bible says you can't have fellowship with him. The father will not, will not compromise with sin. He's taking care of sin. You're without excuse. We'll get into that. Okay, let's go on. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, the son cleanses us from all sin. He says, if we are to walk in the light as he is in the light, well, gee whiz, we got to find out what it means to walk in the light. Amen? 
Now, please note, please note here. He says, this is so vital. But it says, we all can lie, have fellowship with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we are walking the light, he's in light. He says, the blood, the blood of Christ cleanses us. It washes us. It cleans us. It purifies us. It works on us. It's a continuous process. Now, I want you to know the Bible says the blood of Christ, not a ceremony, not water baptism, not church membership, not confession in a booth to a man. The blood of Christ washes you. Oh, don't get past this one. Don't do this with this one. Why? Oh, because if I preach Christ and him crucified, half of the folks are going to walk out the door. I don't want that kind of gospel. I want that modern hyper gospel they're preaching right now. I want that kind of that preaching that, man, you know, they got mega churches now. People, people, uh, listen, 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 listen. People, listen, churches don't change people. Pastors don't change people. Bible teachers don't change people. The word of God changes people. We don't change the word of God. We don't alter the word of God. The word of God changes us. Gosh, you plead the blood of Jesus Christ. The, Lucifer hates that word. He hates that. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over my kids, my wife, my family, the blood of Christ, blood of Christ. I use that. I exercise. Did you hear the pastor Sunday? You not only got to believe the word, you got to exercise the word. Amen. You got to speak the word. Amen. Split foot. Don't like that. Okay. Okay. Now we're not going to get past this. And we're not going to go deep on this. <laughs> All right. Verse eight. It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Oh, we got to stay there. Gosh, John, man, you're kind of, you know, you're kind of hard. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Wow, what does that mean? Wow. Wait a minute. Time out. Brother Louie, I'm, I'm saved. I accepted Christ 10 years ago, and I was born again. Are you saying I'm not saved? No, that's not what the Scripture's saying. Again, we're talking about fellowship with the Father. Now, I want to bring up a, a point, a principle here that needs to be defined, and we're not going to go past this until we get it. Upon salvation, upon receiving Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, the Bible says that our sins are washed. Our sins are taken care of by the blood of Jesus Christ in the finished word. He's an atonement. He has, he has taken our sins and our punishment for us. Amen. We're not, we're, not, we're not addressing that issue at all. But it says here, if we, have, if we say we have no sin. Now, it would have been great to have been saved. And again, I, I repeated myself. It said, hey, everything's taken care of. In fact, when I got saved, I said, why don't you just rapture me, rapture me now? So I, I just want to go home. Um, I don't want to stay here. No, no, that doesn't work that way. Uh, some of you are saying, if I accept Jesus Christ, will my problems go away? No, they may even multiply. The Bible says that, not me. But you're saved. Now, what is it saying then? It says here, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You mean you can deceive yourselves? In other words, if I'm saved, Louis, and I'm washed in the blood, why do I have to confess my sins again? You just said the blood of Christ cleanses me, washes me from all sin. Because there are a group of people out there then and even now that say this, I don't have to confess my sins. I have a right. Very popular book, very popular pastor. I won't name him and I won't name the book. I've studied the book. I love the book. Tell you the truth, I love, I love what he said in it. But he was bringing out a principle about this very thing we're talking about. Why do I have to confess my sins if the blood of Jesus Christ has washed my sins and I have been forgiven? And it's, in other words, and he was bringing out a principle about the complete work of Jesus Christ on the cross, which was important. And he did bring it out, but he leaned toward you would walk away thinking, I no longer have to confess my sins. Now, why do we confess our sins now after we've been saved? 
Why is he why is he throwing that in there? You gotta think about it. Think about it. Because my sins are, I am forgiven. I'm I'm going home pretty soon. I don't doubt that one minute. I don't doubt the finished work of the cross. But why is he addressing this here? Because, because there are the, there are teachings out there that says you don't have to, and there's a there's a like a, a danger about that. Now, we don't confess our sins, people, because we're not forgiven. We don't confess our sins because we're not forgiven. We confess our sins because we are forgiven. What are you trying to say? Saying that he's saying, I keep myself in check. I know, I know that while I'm in this body, I know that it's God has made provision for me to address this issue. The book of Romans really nails it for you. But maybe we'll get into that next time. But while I'm in this body, while I'm living on this earth, I am prone to, I am prone to darkness. I am prone to things to make mistakes. I'm prone to fall on my face. Everybody out there, everybody got to say amen out there because everybody, yeah, yeah. Accepting Jesus Christ, no, you're going to, you're going to fall. You're going to, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to, you're going to, you know, somebody said you're going to sin. You're going to, you're going to mess up. So he's saying, he says, we have no sin. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I said this earlier. Grace and mercy. God paid the price to extend grace and mercy. Grace and mercy is extended to the sinner. What do you mean, Brother Louis? Well, you've got a group of people out there who will say something like this. I'm only human. And they make an excuse for their sin. You even, hear, you even see, I even hear Christians use that phrase. Holy Ghost gave me a check one day on that. I said, well, I'm only human. And the Holy, check, the Holy Spirit gave me a check. That's a check. He says, an unsaved generated person can say that, but you can't say that. And I said, why can't I say that? He says, because of, therefore, if anyone, woman or man, be in Christ, they are a new what? Creation. He says, you can't say that. They can say that, but you can't say that. The blood of Christ my DNA lives in you, Louis. God's DNA lives. You can't say that. You have no excuse. If you're a new creation, old things pass away. Behold, all things become what? New. I didn't know that. You know why you didn't know that? Because you don't read your Bible. And if you did, you don't take it seriously. Okay, so we say we have no sin. We deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh my gosh, if we confess our sins, wow. Wow. Can I say something? For you proud people out there, when God says you confess your sins, I've heard this on a prayer. If, Lord, we have offended you. If, Lord, we have sinned. No, 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 no. He's not asking for that if. He's saying, you know exactly what I'm addressing. Don't give me that if. I saw you check out Betty Boo walking down the street. I saw you uh, lie on your taxes. I saw you take the tithe and put it in your pocket. Confess it. Now, when you confess it, confess it. In other words, listen. He's saying here, listen. If we say we, he says, uh, he says, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. If he is in the light and we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin, you be honest with God and God is going to be, he's going to meet his end of it. If you come out and give you and, and be honest with him, I can't imagine being dishonest with God. Are you kidding? It's better to cancel a walk out and, and to, be, to go out on your knees and get all religious and sit there. You can con God. Come on. I used to go up there and he would say to me, well, why, do you, why, why do you talk this way? You don't need to talk to me in King James. Just talk to me in a normal language. There are times when I go to Heavenly Father and I'm, I'm, I'm upset. And I would tell him, he said, well, lay it on me. Lay it on me. But after, after you talk to Heavenly Father for a while, it, it's going to change. Why? Because in his presence and fellowship with him. But he said, listen, 
you cannot be in light and be in darkness. It's just not going to jive. It's not going to work. In other words, come out cling with God. Be honest with him. He says, listen, if you come out and be clean with me, I'll be clean with you, and I'm going to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He's going to back up his word. Do you believe that? Remember, Brother, brother Jay says, says you got to use the word and know the word. Now, you got to know them. you got to know do more than know. You actually got to. It says here, uh, it says, he'll why, cleanse me from all sin. Do you believe that? Do you believe God will cleanse you from all sin, past sins, present sins? Huh? You don't need future sins. I can say that, and I would be biblical. You need today. You need today. You need. You know, you messed up yesterday. You need today. Do you believe that? Do you believe God will cleanse you from all sin? That's pretty. I did some pretty heavy stuff. Okay, the blood of Christ will take care of it. Amen. Mercy and grace, people. You hear those words? They, they're energy. Mercy and grace. How do you think God can extend mercy and grace to you? Mm hmm. Because his son paid the price. That's why. Okay. So if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. Who is faithful? God is faithful. He is faithful. Just and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Ooh. John, why would you put that in there? If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. So again, I say, don't go up to God and say, if we have sinned, you know you sinned. The Holy, okay. There's a word I'm going to bring up, conviction. There's three words I want to bring up. Condemnation. Guilt. Conviction. Three different words, three different meanings. If you're under condemnation or you're under guilt, you need to read this. You need to believe this. Because after you read this, you will understand there is a lot of difference between conviction and condemnation and guilt. Guilt's not going to get you to repent. Condemnation is going to kill you. Do split for to make sure of that. If, if you're under condemnation right now and you're a child of God, that ain't from him. Okay? That's you know what? We blame split foot a lot for that. But I've seen Christians condemn themselves. Who are you to condemn God in you? Huh? Holy Spirit told me one time, Louis, who are you to condemn me and you? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And I used to think that was a muscle scripture. Yeah, I'm big and bad. No, no. He said, no, I live in you. I'm greater than you. Who are you to condemn me in you? I'm going to work out. You're belong to me. In other words, you sit there. You don't belong to yourself. Christian, you don't belong to yourself. You belong to him. It's not about you anyway. It's all about him. So why are you sitting there claiming what's not yours? You belong to him. That should make you, that should make you happy. That shouldn't mean that's not condemnation. The world will condemn you. Split will condemn you. People will condemn you. People will hurt you. People in churches will hurt you. But that's not from God. That's not from the Heavenly Father. Now, if you're holding darkness in your life and there's separation and fellowship, you can take care of it. All you got to do is go to these scriptures to say, He'll cleanse it from all righteousness if you come clean with Him. Remember, He's light. He's not going to dilly-dally with sin. He's not going to compromise with sin. He took care of it already. So you're without excuse. Okay, so it's important, amen? He, John lays down the foundation. John lays down the foundation here. I'm not sure I want to go on with this study. Yeah, you got to go on with this study because there's, there's the good, the gospel is with the good news, Amen. There's, 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 there, listen, I already give, the word's already given you the antidote. He's already given you the answer to it. So, if we say that we have not sinned, we have made him a liar, and his word is not in us. Amen. Praise God. God has more and gone out of his way to have a relationship with you. He is more and paid the price for, gosh, you can come to the table. You can come to, you can come to Christ Jesus. 
I'm reminded of I'm reminded of a um, portion of scripture upon the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And he was giving me an example. He was teaching me. God teaches me a lot of things. Praise God. Amen. I was a young Christian. Amen. Remember in the Old Testament, the veil and the Holy of Holies. This is the veil. Picture it. On this side, God, the Holy of Holies, this side, you. Okay? The priest would come once a year, and if he was if he was right with God, he would offer sacrifices unto God. But no one could come into this. Anyone that would come into this and that was that was not supposed to be there was instantly killed. When Jesus hung on the cross, you it, it merits a beautiful study. Many things happened and transpired. But when Jesus gave up the ghost and said it was finished. God poured all the sins of the world in Christ Jesus for you and me. One of the things that happened in the temple is that the veil was there and the sacrifice was accepted. And from top to bottom, from top to bottom, the veil was torn. Man didn't tear it from bottom to top. God tore it from top to bottom. Now you have access. Now you can come into the Holy of Holies. God has made it more. He is, if anything, he's, he's overpaid the price so you can have fellowship with him. He desires that fellowship. Amen? That's the good news. Now, get emotional about that. Any questions? I got some. Hey, Chris? No? Okay. Thank you. Ah, okay. Well, how much time we got? Okay. All right. I got a tiny limit here. Can I go a little chapter two? Now, I'm going to have Charity read uh, uh, verses one and two of chapter two of First John. My dear children. I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much. Woo! These are two, um, I should say, memory verses. Yeah, they're memory verses. They're highlight verses. Get your highlight, and if you got one of those, uh, you know, Devices, they say you can highlight on it and stuff. But it says, notice the words John uses, my little children. Born again, young Christians, I notice as, as, I, as I grow mature in Christ, they are sensitive, so sensitive, like children are in the natural. In other words, Born again, baby Christians are sensitive to God's love. They've been introduced to agape. Wow. Wow. It's like, wow, you thought you had love over here. Love. Man, when agape love comes into you, you're so sensitive to it. I, I appreciate that about that. I appreciate and identify with a body of people, of believers that you could come into, and immediately you feel the love of Christ. Immediately you feel, um, you feel that you're at home. Gosh, fellowship with the Father and the Son. One of those key elements in knowing, in knowing, this is how we know, is that we can have fellowship with one another. In other words, um, you cannot have and claim to have fellowship with God and not have the same for a fellow brother and sister in Christ. You can't. It just doesn't go. In other words, I look forward to being around my Christian brothers and sisters in Christ because we have that common, we have fellowship, we have this, we share this Jesus Christ together. 
It's an attraction. You can't separate them. Uh, later on, I'm going to go on the lesson how the, the two, two commandments about loving God and loving thy neighbor, they're inseparable. You can't break them. You can't, have, you, can't have, you can't say you love God and hate your neighbor. You really can't love your neighbor unless you're loving God either. So they're inseparable. Well, let's get into that. My little children, I write these things to you so that you, that you may not sin. Interesting. Interesting. John says, uh, the previous strength on chapter one, I'm writing these things to you so you will not sin. He goes, you know, if you look at the chapter, he's already given provision for sin, the blood of Christ. Amen. Confession of sin, relationship and fellowship with him. Gosh, I can't I can't hardly wait to to get into it even more. But he says, he said, little children, these things are right to you that you may not sin. Now, let's understand something here. Let's make it clear. He's not speaking about perfection here, sinless perfection. Are you speaking about sinless perfection? No, oh my gosh. If you ever hear somebody say, <laughs> I have arrived, you know, I'm there. He says, no, now while we're still in this encapsulated physical body, one day we're going to have a glorified body, the Bible teaches us, Amen. But while we're here, that's why it's important, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we, we fellowship together. It, actually, um, you remember when Jesus Christ washed the feet of the disciples? Amen? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, you sure you do. And he girded himself with a tie, and he, he sit there, and he washes the feet. And Peter says, you know, not me, Lord, you know. And Jesus says, if I can't wash your feet, you have no part in me. And Peter, of course, he's outspoken. You know, he's always putting his foot in his mouth, and, he says, well, then wash it. It's not necessary. The point is this. When we get together, we wash each other's feet. Okay? We sit, when we fellowship, we wash each other's feet. Because we live here. We're going to get dirty. Interesting. Isn't it interesting that Jesus washed their feet? Why? Because this is what touches the ground. <laughs> this is what gets dirty first. Amen? Oh, yeah, it's necessary that we, in other words, there's no Lone Rangers here. If you're one of those that believes, you no, know, I don't have to belong to a church. I don't have to belong to a body. You're not biblical. You don't line up with the word. You just don't. Amen? Well, I've been called to walk alone. Okay? All right. You're still not biblical. Anyway, I write these things that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an, what? That's an interesting word. Advocate with the Father. If everyone sins, when you fall on your face, and you're going to fall on your face, when you mess up, you're going to mess up. <laughs> if you're married, you're going to mess up. Why? Ah, I just know. Husband and wives, hmm, you got to work on that, don't you? I got a lot of heads knobbing up and down. You know, they're, you know, they're married, you know. So. Praise God. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Oh, what's an advocate? Amen? If you break down the word in the Greek, it means, a, a, um, I'll use it briefly, it means counselor. It means one who counsels, one who comes to, one to com one who comes to comfort. It also means, in I guess in English we would put it, it means a lawyer, or one that goes in between, like a lawyer. Gosh, here's another antidote. To your sin problem. Here's he's saying, hey, listen, if you do and you will, he's saying you've got a lawyer. Gosh. That's so important. I messed up so many times, you guys. I got tired asking for forgiveness. In other words, do you remember growing up as a young Christian and you would go around the mountain? Louis, you didn't learn it the first time. I'm going to go the second time. Third time. I'm getting tired of going on the same, same problem all the time. <laughs> Listen, God's going to work it out. God's, going to, God's the master. He's, he's taking that clay and he's going to get what he wants out of you. So it's important to know that when you do make a mistake, when you do fall on your face, and you will, you have an advocate with the Father. Amen, Lord Jesus Christ. There are many times when I tell split foot, this is what split foot will do. When you make a mistake or you fall on your face, he'll say this to you. Ha! And you call yourself a Christian. Ha! 
Nice sermon. You just blew it. Oh, I, I'll say this. He'll make it feel that, you know, and, and it, you know what? And I'm going to tell you, and it's probably true. You did mess up. You did sin. You did make a mistake. That's not the issue. The issue is, is you've got an advocate. You've got a lawyer. And this is what happens. I says, take it up with my lawyer. This is what I told him. Take it up with my lawyer. He's never lost a case. Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, my lawyer, takes my case to court, takes your case to court. And this is what he does. He goes up to the judge. He's in court. Dig this. This is cool. You'll love this because it's not that complicated. Goes up to the judge. He says, Lord, Louis did mess up. He is a sinner. He, he messes up a lot. But uh, I paid the price for him. He's one of mine. In fact, he'll even use the word this. Father, Louis is one of mine. And I paid the price for him. Interesting, huh? My lawyer and the judge are related. Talk about knowing some people. Think about it. My lawyer is the son of the judge. The judge is the father. Come on. That's a winning, that's a winning combination. Lucifer don't want you to know that. Oh, yeah. And he'll say, hey, yeah, you messed up. You messed up. But um, give them back to me and I'll handle it. You see, a lot of people use that verse and say, you know what? I'll go ahead and do it. I'll just confess my sin and I'll be forgiven because he said he'll forgive me. Oh, I see people do that. Oh, my gosh. You mean we take advantage of grace? We take advantage of the blood of Jesus Christ? Oh, some Christians do. They think they can get away with it. But this is what else, this is, this is what came to me. Jesus, give me back Louis and I'll make him go around the mountain again. The more Lord, uh, judge, father, give me back your name. Put your name in there and I'll work on it. Remember, come on. Remember when Peter just had, came off a spiritual high? Huh? And then Jesus rebuked him because he said, not so, Father. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan. That pride came out of Peter. And Jesus said this to him, Satan has asked for you that he could sift you like wheat. He's asked for you. He's a you actually gave him permission to work on you. And you know what Jesus said? He said, no, I'm going to protect Peter. You're not going to have to. No, he didn't. He didn't say that. He said, Peter, I have prayed for you so that your faith won't fail you. You're going to go through the ringer. You're going to go through the ringer. You think you can go to court with the Lord and say, hey, yeah, I'm here the, the 20th, 30th time on the same sin? He goes, no, you're not, man. You're going to go back and you're going to go around the mountain, around the mountain. Why? Because you belong to him. You want, you're in the family. If you weren't in the family, he wouldn't do it. He had nothing to do with it. But you're going to go around until what? Maybe you have a problem with unforgiveness. Woo! He's going to take it around. Maybe you have a pride issue. Woo! He's going to take it around and deal with pride. Amen? Maybe you gossip a lot. Amen? He's going to take care of that tongue too. Amen? That's love because you're in the family. If you're not in the family, nothing happens. Woo! <laughs> you don't want to be there, man. In fact, chastisement really is a sign that you belong to him. Come on. That's biblical. I don't want to be chastised. That's too bad. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to him. Okay. You know, we're close to time, huh? I'm going to go verse 3. I'm going to leave you with verse 3. You got to, you got to chew on this, you guys. This is why I love the book. Now, by this, we know that we know him. And I'm not going to complete the verse, but I want you to know the word no. Look up the word no. And this, and by this, we know. Oh, come on. You don't have to walk like, what if? How do I know? Uh-uh. John says, you can know. And this by we know. Oh. Gosh. 
the manual, huh? Here's the instruction manual right here. Wow. Okay, come back next Tuesday. We're going to get in this book until we get it. Now, gosh, I know there's probably a lot of questions or you disagree with what I just said. No, if you disagree with what the word says, because it's not my opinion I'm putting on here. This is what the word says. But it's cool. It's so righteous, it's so beautiful to be one of us and to walk in the light as he is in the light and in fellowship with him. Amen. Okay, so have a blessed day. Uh, stay out of the heat. Get some air conditioning going. We'll see you next Tuesday, Lord willing. If not, I'll see you in the clouds.